I now move to the House to the debate on this House believes the war on terror has been its own worst enemy. And I look to Rebecca Collins, Balliol College, to open the case for the proposition. Thank you, Mr. President. May I firstly say what an extraordinary honour it is to be able to speak in this chamber tonight on such an important issue. The motion asks whether or not the war on terror has been its own worst enemy. When thinking about what this means, it is important to first understand how the war on terror came about. Following the terrorist attacks of 9-11, George W. Bush declared war on terrorism, saying that the war will not end until every terrorist group of global reach has been found, stopped and defeated. Thus, since 2001, the United States has spent over five, five and a half trillion dollars on military action, and it is estimated that over 370,000 people have died in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Pakistan as a direct consequence of this war, with over 60% of these deaths being civilian deaths. And for what? Terror threat levels are at record highs across Europe and the United States, and both the United States and Europe have suffered de deadly terrorist attacks in recent years and all the while, military budgets continue to rise. If the war on terror's objective was to defeat global terrorism, then it has most certainly failed. <coughs> Not only has it failed to achieve its objective, but also the war on terror has explicitly exacerbated the issue that it aimed to solve. There is a very strong case to suggest that the United States actions in Iraq and Afghanistan, for example, have increased the security threat rather than reduced it. And this brings me to my two main arguments for tonight. Firstly, the war on terror has failed because it elevated terror organizations to a military level when terrorism should be dealt with as a political issue. And secondly, as a consequence of being distracted by a policy of regime change, the United States has made the problem worse by providing a power vacuum for new terrorist organizations to step into. Before I go any further, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the other speakers in the debate tonight, and we have quite a few of them. So, speaking first for the opposition, we have Sir Mark Rowley, a retired senior police officer with over 30 years of experience, who formerly served as the Metropolitan Police's Assistant Commissioner and the UK's lead for counter-terrorism policing. We are also joined by Ambassador Gerald Feierstein, who worked for over 40 years in the United States Foreign Service serving as US ambassador to Yemen between 2010 and 2013, as well as developing a range of initiatives in the US State Department to confront extremist groups. Thirdly, we have Elaine Duke. Ms. Duke was Deputy Secretary of the, Homeland, of the Department of Homeland Security between 2017 and 2018, serving under President Donald Trump. Ms. Duke has worked for the federal government for over three decades with several appointments in the Department for Defense. And our final speaker on the opposition side is General Graham Lamb, a retired British Army officer who served in Northern Ireland, Bosnia and Iraq. General Lamb is a former commander of the Field Army at Land Command and was director of UK Special Forces under Tony Blair. I'm honoured to be joined on the proposition side by Sir Ivor Roberts, the former British ambassador to Yugoslavia, Ireland and Italy. Sir Ivor has served as head of the Security Coordination Department in the Foreign Office overseeing their counter-terrorism response, and is now an advisory board member of the Counter-Extremism Project. And I must say, I'm wonderfully reassured having you alongside me tonight. Speaking third is David Pratt, the former Canadian Minister of National Defence and Chair of the Commons Defence Committee. After his time in government, Mr Pratt went on to serve as the senior parliamentary expert in Iraq as part of the Iraq Legislative Strengthening Programme. And last, but by no means least, we have Congresswoman Jane Harmon. Congresswoman Harmon served as the ranking Democrat on the Homeland Security Intelligences Subcommittee for a number of years and is now the president of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Mr. President, these are your guest speakers and they are of course most welcome. At the heart of terrorism is a desire to instill fear, a stomach-churning fear that means that people are afraid to use public transport, to visit cities, 
to go to popular tourist spots, a fear which, when you think about it, is wholly disproportionate to the actual threat these terrorist groups pose. In reality, there is an enormous gulf between the actual capability of these groups and the fear that they inspire. <coughs> and I would argue that the terrorists are aided in this cause by the actions of Western governments as part of the war on terror. Now, I am sure the oppos opposition speakers will claim that without the war on terror, the risk to citizens in the United States and the United Kingdom would have been much greater, that many more people would have died had America and her allies not so aggressively pursued such terrorist organizations. And to these claims, I say this. The war on terror set Western governments up to fail. It necessitates that the tactics of war, a complex military operation with troops, arms, and a ground strategy, is the mode of operation. But terrorism cannot be defeated as if it were a foreign army with resources on the ground with which to engage. Instead, terrorist groups rely on a limited number of individual covert military capabilities to achieve their mainly political aims. And so when we think about it, fighting terrorism using a military approach could never have been successful. Terrorism must be managed and controlled and treated as a political issue. Most terrorist organisations are motivated by political aims, such as seizing power, claiming back land, and establishing the rights of certain minority groups. The war on terror has been its own worst enemy, as it has been ineffective as a result of counterproductive policies. You cannot beat terrorism by using a military strategy. It is a political problem that needs a political solution. Now, Iraq is a case in point. In 2003, the United States Army invaded Iraq to remove Saddam Hussein from power, a man they deemed to have connections to terrorism. Following his successful removal, the Americans began a process of supposed democracy building. The lack of even a basic understanding of the economic and social nature of Iraq caused their efforts to be completely in vain. Now, firstly, the American administration began the debathification of Iraqi society, which meant that every member of the Ba'ath Party was deprived of their job. Many of the teachers and doctors in that country were unable to work and society inevitably suffered as a consequence. This resulted in serious social grievances, which increased hatred and resentment of the stationed US forces, as well as to the West as a whole. To compound this, the Americans continued the peace-building process in Iraq by dismantling the Iraqi army. As a result, tens of thousands of men were left without a job, and their previous service was completely disregarded. Many members of the army, special forces, and the police were put into prison, where in an atmosphere of discontent, the ideology and fanaticism of the Islamic State was allowed to emerge and to grow. And this brings me to my second point. The fact that the ineffective policies pursued under the guise of the war on terror have actually made the security situation worse rather than better by providing a power vacuum for other terrorist organizations, such as ISIS, to step into and grow. It is a fact that the unstable security situation in Iraq can be traced back to the creation of ISIS in 2006 as a splinter group of Al-Qaeda. If the objective of the war on terror was to reduce the risk from terrorism to the United States and to other Western countries, then the emergence of ISIS surely confirms that this objective has failed. From the Paris shootings in November 2015, in which at least 130 people died, to the Manchester Arena bombings just last year, in which 22 civilians died, to the London Bridge attack just a month later, in which nearly a dozen people died, Europe has been rocked by attack after attack after attack. Ordinary people like you, like me, just going about their day-to-day -day lives, attending a pop concert, going for dinner, out for a walk with friends, are suffering the consequences of a failed foreign policy. The United States and her allies, including the United Kingdom, have increased the threat to their citizens rather than decreased it. Back in 2003, President Barack Obama, before he was president, in reference to the war on terror, said, this war, like all wars, must end. That's what history advises, and that's what our democracy demands. He cited James Madison's dictum, 
that no nation can preserve its freedom in the midst of continual warfare. And the speech's essence was a nuanced pitch for the United States to move gradually towards a non-war footing in the long fight against Al-Qaeda and associated groups. Obama called for a modification and ultimate repeal of the laws passed after 9-11, including the Patriot Act, and he continued to express a desire to close Guantanamo Bay. Now, President Obama clearly recognised that the war on terror just was not working, both in terms of the rhetoric, but also in terms of the cost-benefit analysis. Imagine how different the world would look today if the United States had spent the money that it used to fund the war on terror to find a political solution through educational programmes, through vocational skills training, or through investment. In short, the war on terror has been, not, has been one of, if not the defining foreign policy initiative of the 21st century, and the spillover effects of this campaign have reached every continent, from Indonesia to Libya to France and here in Britain too. By declaring war on terrorism, the United States and her allies have attempted to quash the threat by using a hardline military strategy. This has not worked. In fact, it has made the problem worse. The war on terror has been its own worst enemy. And so I ask you, when you vote this evening on this motion, to think about the situation in Britain today. There is a reason we must arrive at the airport hours before our flight departs. There is a reason there are armed police patrolling the tube network in central London. And there is a reason that our terror threat level remains at severe, meaning that unfortunately a terror attack is highly likely. Global terrorism has not been defeated and clearly still remains a serious concern. The threat of terrorism is now an everyday reality for each and every one of us. The threat has been made worse and not better by the war on terror. And it is for these reasons that I strongly urge you to vote with the proposition this evening. Thank you.